Okay, welcome everyone who has joined today for this excellent seminar on pediatric tuberculosis, confusions and consensus on behalf of the Gujarat WhatsApp group. And this is the second CME uh, of this year. And we have promised to do it every month on different topics. We have dignitaries who have, we have invited on the Zoom link. And there are several uh, who have uh, joined as delegates in the main, main web stream, stream which was shared. And uh, we are very happy that today we have a galaxy of uh, panelists. And I mean, I, I don't think so when it comes to pediatric TB, you can ask for anything more than the guru of TB, Dr. Varinder Singh, the guru of TB treatment, Dr. Sushant Mane from JJ Hospital, and guru of my, my guru, Dr. Vijay Yevle. So they are the ones who have actually also helped make the module NTEP. And if any one of you has not undergone the training through the NTEP module, should do it, either self-learning or in one of the NTEP program, because that's, I think, one of the best modules I've ever seen, which is so practical, which actually helps you to guide into correct treatment, including understanding what is MDR-TB. So TB is on the rise and we have sort of committed that we will eliminate TB from India. Of course, we have said 2030, maybe it may take a few more years, doesn't matter, like polio, unless you begin, you will never achieve your target. So from that point of view, the pediatric TB being even more difficult to diagnose and to treat, we have this uh, uh, galaxy of uh, speakers today. Before we start with Dr. Ramesh Bajania, the Maha champion of the Gujarat WhatsApp group and a co-moderator with me today, we have dignitaries whom we have invited, so we'll ask them to say a few words before we uh, start the program. And I think the first thing I will ask is, we have the chief guest, Dr. Uh, Chejara, who is the president of the IIP Maharashtra State Branch. And we have the guest of honor, Dr. Amul Pawar, who is the secretary general of the Maharashtra IIP Branch. He's also the EB member, and so also Dr. Ram Gopal. So Ram Gopal, maybe a few lines from you and then Amol. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. A respected Varinder Singh, sir. Yevle sir, Dr. Nitin Shah sir, Dr. Ramesh Bajaniya sir, my teacher Dr. Bela Varma madam and Dr. Sushant Bani. The WhatsApp webinar group is a great initiative by Dr. Ramesh Bajaniya sir and equally supported by our president of president Dr. Nitin Shah sir. <laughs> and uh, they have taken the web, uh, online academics to a new height. So, on the behalf of Maharashtra IP, I congratulate to the team. And uh, it's a great initiative by Gujarat IP. And now, in the future, you will see a cumulative joint venture by Gujarat IP, Maharashtra IP, and Go Go uh, Goa IP. Very so, yes, we are perfect. forming the waste zone uh, states together. So, thanks everyone. And over to you, Nitin Shah, sir. Yeah. Once Amol, again, congratulations for this great initiative. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ram Gopal. A more few words from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nitin Shah, sir. <clears throat> and it was a great pleasure to be called as a guest of honor along with Dr. <laughs> Ram Gopal Chedara, sir, being the chief guest. We can, I can see a galaxy of uh, the colleagues and seniors and you being the president of president. Dr. Jadish Chinappa, sir, is there. Dr. Vijay Ole, sir, is there. And today's topic, <clears throat> genetic TB, Confusions and consensus. We have great stalwarts, the senior academicians, Dr. Vijay Ole, sir, Dr. Varinder Singh, sir, the uh, and the our young, our own young dynamo, Dr. Sushant Mane, with us. And this is a very nice initiative. Since last uh, seven ten years, it has been going on. Uh, and the <clears throat> backbone of this, Dr. Ramesh Bajania, sir, is a very senior AB member from Gujarat and. Uh, he is very innovative and he has many credentials to his name. He is the uh, also uh, active in environmental chapter and uh, equally supported by Dr. Nitin Shah sir, Dr. Chetan Trividi sir, I can see Dr. Anand Keshwan sir, the future president <laughs> is also there and Dr. Bala sir is there, Dr. Jitu sir is there, Bela ma'am, everyone has joined, Dr. Alok Bandari from Delhi, he has also joined. I give all the best to this webinar. And uh, to each one of you, a happy learning from Maharashtra IP also. And congratulations from the team Maharashtra IP. Over to you, Nitin, sir. Thank you, 
Thank you, Amol. So we have galaxy of uh, dignitaries, as has been mentioned by both Dr. Ram and Dr. Amol. So we will not repeat the name, but welcome everyone on the Zoom link and all the uh, people who have joined in the web stream to learn today uh, for the topic. So we start with the today's topic, and I would, uh, of course, I would like to thank Zydus for providing this web stream platform as well as the Zoom link for uh, for the faculty. So Dr. Trambak Dutta is there as the medical director of the Zydus group. Maybe two minutes, uh, Trambak, you can just uh, take it forward and then we go to the uh, today's topic that is TB. Sure, sir. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Trambak, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me, sir, now? Yes, now it's okay. We can hear you, yes. Thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, I am Dr. Chandrak, uh, Medical Advisor for Vaccines at Zydus Life Sciences Limited. And I will just take you all to the Zydus corporate presentation quite quickly uh, without taking much of uh, the precious time. So uh, Zydus's vision, mission, and purpose, as all of you are aware of, is uh, to be a global life sciences company, uh, which is already transforming lives through path-breaking discoveries. And of course, the mission and purpose to empower people with the freedom to live healthier and more fulfilled lives. Uh, it, has, it is already a well-integrated pharma player with a proven track record with many firsts. It is the first to launch the travel influenza vaccine in India, that is Vaccine Q4. Uh, it is the first to launch the biosimilar of Adalimumab anywhere in the world globally to discover and develop an NC in-house, that is Lipavirin Sarogetazar. Uh, it is the first to have Oxemia, first of its kind oral tablet in India for anemia in CKD. And Zycov B, as all of you are, we are aware of, uh, is uh, definitely a pioneer. Zydus is a pioneer in specifically creating a particular base for the DNA vaccine. And also it has a plethora of biosimilars in pipeline and already launched a lot of products in that particular area. So Zydus uh, has high-end APIs and intermediates and it is onto all these uh, uh, things which you can see on the screen. Uh, it is uh, uh, right now having over 23,000 people impacting lives across four continents, as we speak of. Uh, it is expanding all across the country, India, as well as France, Spain, uh, and Brazil, as well as in the United States. So Zydus is innovation-driven with uh, development pipeline is, uh, is teaming with products, vaccines, biosimilars, biologics, uh, 300 plus generic products, uh, more than 1400 research scientists working round the clock. And it uh, not only has the NCEs and NBs, but it also has monoclonal antibodies, uh, wellness products, nutraceutical peptides, and of course, biologicals and vaccines. So it is uh, now right now spanning into cardiometabolic diseases, inflammation, pain, and cancer. And it, it has launched and always launching. Uh, new products that address unmet healthcare needs. Uh, we already discussed about a few out of these on the screen. And as far as the vaccines are concerned, it has uh, tied up with Ethnobiotic, it acquired Ethnobiotic, as well as it has the first of its kind vaccine technology center in Andhra India. So I'll just uh, quickly take you through the journey of uh, Zydus vaccines. Uh, the Zydus uh, 4A launched the typhoid and hepatitis B, uh, then followed by the Vaxivad N, uh, then Vaxiv 2S, uh, followed by in 2015, Vaxiv 2 4, which is India's first uh, ever quadrivalent influenza vaccine, indigenously prepared, and also launched a specific special division for vaccines, that is Vaxicare, followed by its launch of Zyvac PCV in 2018, then Fenrat, that is world's first monoclonal antibody in babies PVP. And followed by Zyko B and Zyvac MMR, which is a measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So, the Zydus Vaxicare Initiative is a VCAR initiative to improve immunization rate in India, uh, followed by all these products, all these vaccines, which you can see on the screen, which we already discussed. And talking about Vaxicu 4, which is India's first indigenously prepared quadrivalent influenza vaccine, is now equipped with uh, Terumo needle, which is a 25 watch needle. Uh, and it has the advantages of being recommended across various age groups and freedom to use any body needle as per doctor's convenience and overcomes the shortcomings of the stack needle. Uh, it assures needle toughness and is much more upgraded than the previous version. So with that, I thank all of you 
for the privilege uh, to speak on this platform. Over to you, Nitin. Thank you. Sandra, you can stop sharing your slides. Yeah, so we are back to the screen. So we start with today's program, and I am very happy to uh, first introduce uh, Dr. Varinder Singh. I remember vividly when I was the president elect in 2005, I went to Delhi to meet him and uh, and requested him to do something on the respiratory tract uh, uh, infection, which was the commonest cause of morbidity and mortality. And he came out with the brilliant idea of the RTI gem, the respiratory tract infection group education material, uh, which, which started during my tenure and then now is still continuing. He is, of course, the director and the professor of pediatrics at the Lady Harding Medical College, which is also associated with the Kalavadi Saran Children Hospital. But more than that, he's a real expert in respiratory medicine and especially TB. And today, the national program of TB for pediatric, the NTP module, etc., is all brainchild of Dr. Varinda Singh with lots of other people who have joined. So welcome, Dr. Varinda Singh. We are blessed to have you. Uh, next, we have Dr. Sushant Mane. I, I mean, people from Mumbai to know him and Maharashtra know him very well that you have any difficulty as far as TB is concerned, just send to Dr. Ma Sushant in the JJ hospital and he will take care of it, especially when it comes to MDR, XDR, pre-XDR, etc. Uh, Dr. Sushant Mane is the Associate Professor in Pediatrics at the Government Grand Medical College, what we used to call uh, GMC and the JJ group of hospitals. And he's the nodal officer for pediatric TB uh, at the National Center for Excellence uh, for TB. And I think uh, JJ Hospital really can uh, be proud that, that they have one of the best centers for pediatric TB. And uh, Dr. Sushant Mane and Dr. Bela Verma, of course, also is here. They are all helping our uh, patients to recover uh, fast. Last but not the least is my dear friend, Dr. Vijay Yevle. He's a director of uh, his Yevle Children Hospital. He is the head of the pediatric department at the Apollo Group of Hospital Navi Mumbai and as a very renowned IT consultant. And I'm sure he's also contributed equally to the NTEP program. So with that uh, 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 introduction of the faculty, and of course, as I already said, already we have a co-moderator, uh, Dr. Ramesh Bajania. So we will take it forward. Now, just one disclaimer that if we have a lot thing to discuss in pediatric TB, essentially I have divided into two, diagnostic and then therapeutic. And it being a vast subject, we don't want to rush into because people have to learn the nuances very clearly. So if it comes to that we are short of time, we may actually end only at the diagnostic part. And we promise that the next month or maybe whenever early as possible, we will have one more uh, session of one to one and a half hours on the therapeutic because therapeutic also has so much confusion about which drug to use, etc. So if, if we have able to cover both today fine otherwise be rest assured that we will not rush through and we will actually continue with the part two for the therapeutic <clears throat> and my first question to dr vijay Yevle, you know today you are so much respiratory infection in children who especially when go to school they keep on getting again and again and then the one thing that comes in mind is is my child having tb when he gets recurrent infection so what is the clinical scenario where you would suspect tb vis-a-vis -vis a viral infection or a recurrent wheeze and so on and so forth. So good evening to all and thank you Nitin and Ramesh. And uh, just to get on to the subject, as you rightly said, there are you know, certain symptoms which are taken as you know indicating underlying TB, say fever of uh, two weeks or more, cough, weight loss or failure to gain weight with or without contact with TB. However, one must remember that these symptoms are common to so many other illnesses. Just Correct. Just so how do you further qualify? So you need to characterize the symptoms. So the fever has to be documented fever. And the significant weight loss or failure to weight gain is 10% in three months. And uh, uh, I mean, it's very easy <laughs> to say that uh, uh, document the weight, but many of us have someone else taking the weight. The child does not uh, stand or sit uh, properly on the weighing scale. Different uh, types of clothings are worn at different visits, and that may lead to errors in uh, actual weight measurement. So one needs to be a little careful. Cough also, most of the vital, I'm, I'm sure each one of us must have experienced children coughing away to glory for more than two weeks in a number of viral infections. However, one, one must remember that persistent fever of two weeks, persistent cough, these yes. are symptoms which are used to label a child as having presumptive TB and then work up further in the form of imaging, that is X-ray chest and nucleic acid amplification test. Right. So one should be a little careful. It, has, it is the non-remitting persistent cough, which is uh, you know uh, taken as into account to call a child as having presumptive TB. 
your acute viral infections are known to have cough which can linger on for three four weeks also and then more commonly what you see especially with uh, in uh, you know metros or in crowded places which is increasing with every passing year is recurrent wheezing when the child is coughing with waxing and waning but the parents fail to realize that there is a uh, uh, waxing and waning and so it is the onus is on the pediatrician to extract this history characterize the symptom so that you know appropriate uh, patients are uh, appropriately labeled as presumptive tb and the diagnostics are used uh, very correctly so the yield to efforts correct so i think uh, very very important message given by dr yevle that you have a persistent and unremitting cough and not the type of cough which vex and wens in a wheezing child and you have a persistent fever which is documented and i said sometime back on my facebook that the award for the most reluctance in the country goes to the parents for not taking temperature of the child and i think we have to stress upon give them a sheet of morning afternoon evening night type of temperature and let them record it and teach them how to do it very well said dr yevle mentioned that tb contact so sushan what do you mean by tb contact like someone may have tb you ask my grandfather had tb 10 years back and my mother had some 15 years back which is a significant tb contact which will add to this algorithm to clinically suspect tb so uh, good evening everybody uh, so like we said as sir just gave the example like 5 10 years is Uh, they may say that they have a tb contact so when we ask the history of tb contact we ask within the past 2 years so that is a very yeah. significant period so why 2 years why not 3 years why not 5 years I'll what happens to... what is the magic but 2 years yeah so the, the thing is why do we stress upon 2 years for that we have to you know understand a little concept of how the disease goes you know infection from disease so yeah. for example if i want to tell you suppose if a person gets infected with tb from an index case Mm -hmm. so there are you know, modeling methods which have shown that mm -hmm. a lifetime risk of a person developing active disease from a infection is around 5 to 10% correct but as that may differ from age to age yes so yes. as we go down the age the risk increases like for example in infancy it is 50% mm -hmm. so in 1 to 5 years it is around 25% beyond mm -hmm. that it becomes 5 to 10% correct this is from progression from infection to disease correct now having said this when does this happen so again there is a lot amount of data which has shown that around 75% of the people who are infected would be developing active disease within the first one year Correct. and 90, 95% within the first two years so Correct. that is why that number of two years has come so when, when we ask the history of tb contact we ask for the contact within the past two years the contact of a pulmonary tb patient is especially important because pulmonary tb is known to be infectious Correct. however if our child is having symptoms suggestive of presumptive tb mm -hmm. then even if a contact was having an extra pulmonary tb mm -hmm. that also becomes significant because we have okay. seen that 25 to 30% of extra pulmonary tb would have a unidentified lung focus correct so that again is important any type of tb contact we have to go into the details <clears> of <throat> contact that is number one and one more point what i want to stress here is the common uh, thing what we do in our opds and ask the history is ghar mein kisi ko tb hai kya mm hmm hmm time the answer is no mm -hmm. now things either the answer is no because people are afraid of getting out the history because of stigma which has gone down now because of the education which we are giving but what we are seeing now is actually there is nobody inside the house the mm -hmm. most obvious contact which comes up is a neighbor okay or somebody right. in children we, we 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 have found contact in the school or something mm -hmm. or the maids coming to the house mm -hmm. so when we stop at that point ghar mein kisi ko mm -hmm. tb hai kya we generally miss the history of contact so we have to go into a little details anybody who is visiting the house for a significant period of time is is on treatment for tb or is having prolonged symptoms correct fine so that mm -hmm. is an important question that sushan man has said that even when you have someone who doesn't have a pulmonary tb but is in contact with a child who is symptomatic as dr evle put is a significant contact so dr varinder is a very intriguing i mean i have a lymph node tb how can i be infecting someone else who is next door in my house so how does a sputum negative vis-a-vis -vis sputum positive tb patients infect the surrounding patients or people okay. so uh, there are two things i i'll break this question into two parts correct one one is a pulmonary smear negative and another is extra pulmonary correct so if it is pulmonary smear negative then the risk is if you it's about uh, if you are smear positive you four times higher odds then if you are in, exposed to a smear negative case mm -hmm. so the the probability is low but it is not zero correct okay. 
so it is it is higher but lesser than higher than the general public no exposure where you do not versus uh to a smear positive would be much much higher for that would be four five times higher than a smear negative correct when it comes to the question you asked about lymph node which is extra pulmonary uh, the extra pulmonary tv can come to a pediatrician can come to a ent surgeon can go to a, a pediatric surgeon or a general surgeon or a gp and depending on the rigor uh, many would just do an fnac from that node it shows a granuloma or cv net positive that's the end of story nobody looks at the uh, you know lung mm hmm mm hmm correct mm -hmm. right? what we forget is that this child may also be having a pulmonary lesion or mm -hmm. an even an adult so studies have shown that nearly one third of extra pulmonary tv have actually got an active pulmonary lesion also at the same time though mm -hmm. their symptoms may not be predominantly respiratory correct therefore they, they get muffled because it's the most predominant symptoms which gets addressed so correct. that's that's something which is important correct. just in the uh, earlier question which sushant was uh, talking about contact history i i i would just qualify that statement about two years a little bit he mm -hmm. also said it but i i want to this message to go read read okay yeah the while it is important that a uh, The exposure in last two years is more likely that you you would get infection. Any exposure within your lifetime is important. It's not that a remote exposure is used there because exposure is equivalent to likelihood of an infection if it is a exposure to a smear positive case. And an infected individual even later on can develop the disease though the higher risk is within first two years as Sushant very clearly mentioned. So that's right. something which is important to remember that uh, and. Today's time, when we do not have simple PPD available, correct so exposure history is equivalent to infection history. You know, that's correct. what we are proving with with, with PPD. So Absolutely, it, it, it is a is a good surrogate. Correct. So, if I understand Dr. Varinder rightly, that when you say someone is sputum positive, smear positive, smear negative, smear neg positive also has a limitation to the load which it can detect. There could be load non detectable on smear, but still the patient can be actually exhaling, especially not if not on treatment. So that's another reason why that, he could that's infect. That's smear negative. No? That's exactly yeah. that's the smear yeah. negative one. So smear negative doesn't mean he's not TB. The he still shed still be organism. Yeah, though in lower concentration. So just on uh, an interesting by fact that many people ask the patient, especially like the mother who is the contact of a child, that you know that she has started treatment. When does she become sputum negative generally in a non-resistant type of TB or a drug sensitive TB? With the current, uh, uh, you know. Uh, therapy modern therapy mm -hmm. which is very effective mm -hmm. usually they say the infectiousness goes down very fast correct it may so go weeks, down three as weeks. Weeks, one to two weeks okay But traditionally we always says when you become smear negative correct which means about four to eight weeks so when do you However, test the vi viability will go mm -hmm. down very fast so when do you so test the uh, in an adult with a second sputum to see whether this person is become sputum negative is it two weeks yeah. or four weeks No, you you don't check before four weeks. First before is at four, four and then next is at eight All weeks. All right. All right. Okay. Fine. All right, Ramesh Bhai, yes, you sir. can take the next very, questions. Very very well explained, Varinder sir. Now, Vijay uh, sir, we had a discussion in our Gujarat pediatrician group few days back about the role of Mantoux test. So now, is it totally out? As someone said that now Mantoux test is no more used. So I would not say that it is totally out. However, if you look at the uh ntp module or the recent teachings the role of this uh, mantu test which essentially tells you about the hypersensitivity exposure to uh, tubercle bacilli and infection but the role of it in diagnosis of tb is uh, in a way down as compared to what used to happen in the past where the tb diagnosis rested on the tripod of you know clinical features a mantu test and x ray correct uh, having said that uh mantu is no longer available it is it is used to make a diagnosis of latent tb infection and uh, in maybe especially the extra pulmonary tuberculosis where you need to have some corroborative supporting evidence where uh, it it may be used the and what about ct test sir yeah so the ppd which was earlier used the stocks uh, have been exhausted so what is uh, replacing it is ctb it is the uh, uh, it is i would say poor man's igra where mm -hmm. uh, two of the three antigens which are used in the igra 
the SAT-10 and CFP-10 are used in the, uh, it's a skin sensitive test after all. And uh, the difference between the, uh, the standard conventional PPD and CTB is, here the cutoff is taken as 5, there it was 10. This is not interfered with by the uh, BCG vaccination. And uh, it is a uh, little more, uh, I would say, uh, it's it's better in that sense uh, as compared to the old conventional PPD. However, let us uh, uh, take it home very clear that whether it is PPD man 2 or CTB or IGRA, what it means is that the uh, child is infected and not, it is it does not differentiate an infection from an active disease. So, so Vijay, let me interfere. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, intervene here that. Uh, you said that in a pulmonary, you will obviously want to have the proof that the MTB is there as I far as possible. Anything. Right. So we will discuss that further. But in an extra pulmonary, like suppose you have a, 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 an abdominal lymph node, it's showing necrosis, you biopsy it, it shows granuloma, it doesn't show the typical granuloma of TB. And there, if MT is positive, it will make you a little more confident. Absolutely. Is that only use of mantus really in a clinical practice? And, and maybe diagnosing latent TB infection when you uh, that's perfect. Use preventive therapy, TB preventive. So that's like people, children who are going abroad and many countries, they they want an MD or a IGRA and if it's positive, they want them to take INH prophylaxis. That's a different ballgame. From disease point Correct. of view, only if you don't have a direct TB organism seen because of the limitation, like in a deep cavity infections, and mm -hmm. if the MT is still positive, it might. But the MT that you said available is, I mean, you, people use any agent, any strength, and <laughs> then re, in, <laughs> interpret anyhow. It's a problem. Where in the what is your? I mean, why is, why is the old empty not available? I mean, what's so big trouble in getting the old empty for at least where you need it? Yeah. So the thing is that old empty PPD only half a kg of it was made, mm -hmm. and that the world has finished. <laughs> so there is no more. So now we have a fresh PPD which has been prepared, Correct. which is which is taken up by the side TV, but Correct. then they are not doing it for children. Correct. Now uh, trouble is that. This test is a is an old partner. So like, you know, all of us are old school. So once married, always married types. So <laughs> it, 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 it's it's a partner which stays with you, sticks with you. Uh, However, this partner has less utility with, with, with the evolution in, in, in Correct. Perfect. All it tells you is that you're infected. And that too also with, with about 80% sensitivity. So Correct. if it is negative, then also it is not sure. And infection rate at the background is so high that if you are positive, you can't say that you are positive and these symptoms are because of TB. Correct. It may or may not be. It is He's... like an allergic test is in, 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 in asthma saying that, okay, Correct. it is positive at 10 things and this is what is causing your asthma, which is also not true. Is CV test available in India, Dr. Vijay, or is likely to be available? No. Uh, C CTB. In fact, CTB has been replaced by, it is oral serum statins uh, product taken over by serum. Now, CYTB. But mm -hmm. that is not at avail available. So it is said it is on the Nikshe portal. I had a word with Sushant in the uh, morning. Mm -hmm. It says it's mm -hmm. being uh, you know piloted in a few districts. Perfect. It's not yet uh, made uh, widely available. Currently, they are giving all, all their uh, production to to the government, mm -hmm. and uh, it's largely being used in 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 above 15, 18 years age. They have done some studies to go up to 15, but they are yeah. not planning any studies for uh, you know people below yeah. 15. Uh, okay, Dr. Ramesh, I think we have lost him in the link, so I'll continue till we... So that brings you to the next question, Sushant. What about IGRA? It's sub, it's at least more uh, reliable than uh, any Mantus done anywhere by anyone interpreting anyhow. At least IGRA is more, though there's not different between latent versus disease, but at least tells you that you are or not infected. So it's, you can, can you elaborate on IGRA? What's the use and how it equates with a Mantus test or a CTB test for a common man who cannot afford IGRA? So the thing is, again, what we must understand is it is giving us the same information which a Mantu test is giving us. That is Correct. the person infected. It won't mm -hmm. tell us the active disease. Mm -hmm. Now, the advantage of IGRA over Mantu test is, as we know, Mantu uses the PPD, which is non-specific. It is Correct. belonging to the mycobacterium group. Now, IGRA, what, what is the basic principle of IGRA is if a patient is infected, okay, blood is drawn from the patient mm -hmm. and it is a tube based test. It is uh, the blood is incubated along with MTB specific antigens. There are two, three specific antigens like ISAT 6 and CFP 10, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. are specific for mycobacterium TB. And mm -hmm. if the person is exposed to TB in his, uh, you know, before we do the test, 
then the activated lymphocytes would secrete interferons interferon okay. gamma so that is the test interferon gamma release assay and it is so that way as compared to the skin test it becomes much more specific mm-hmm. it would not come positive with uh, in a bcg vaccinated child or with non tuberculous mycobacteria the only thing is it is a lab based test so mm-hmm. that needs to be drawn and you get the result so it requires a setup it is test Correct. was really very beneficial when we when people thought of doing it as a screening test Correct. okay igra uh, 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 you know app- applying igra as a screening test becomes little cumbersome because you require a lab setup okay. so that, that thing is there Correct. and the second thing is yes now the program is coming up with igra it has started uh, giving igra in certain places like for example in mumbai we are having igra which is you know given mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. especially uh, it is there in the protocol if we see the ntp protocol when we talk about tb i or tb infection mm-hmm. contacts of pulmonary tb patients mm-hmm. who are above 5 years of age so less than 5 years any which way is the program says we have to give prophylaxis we will discuss that when we talk of prophylaxis but above 5 years or certain high risk groups like for example those who are going on immunosuppressants or transplant mm-hmm. correct they, they are you know uh, we are utilizing igra much more to see whether the patient is having tb infection and for prophylaxis Correct. So same like HIV patients who are IGRA positive, you probably until the time they are oh, immunology concentrated. HIV, HIV uh, they say that HIV you did not do an IGRA. Correct. So HIV, so, if it is in contact with a, if it if the patient has had a contact, you did not do an IGRA. You can straight away give prophylaxis after ruling out active TB. Correct. So I also read one article on some adult TB vaccines being tried, especially of that of GSK, which is a recombinant vaccine. They were yeah. trying to do it, and also for the RBCG. that in people who are igra positive but don't have tb now to prevent them from getting into disease yes. whether there is a therapeutic vaccine sort of uh, in adult so i think these are very exciting result which are likely to come very soon now that brings us to the question that you don't have mantus reliability because a mantus reagent is over and people are using any reagent so people should refrain from doing mantus test igra is expensive has more specific indications to do especially but not as a diagnostic algorithm in pediatric tb so yes. after what dr yevle said as a clinical spectrum where you suspect tb in a child with fever cough with or without contact the next thing you do is x ray right so dr varinder you have beautiful collections of x ray we have seen some of them in the ntp i'm sure you'll have more i request you to share your ppt and show us what is definitive looking like tb and what is probably not suggestive of tb on an x ray chest for children okay. so you can share your slides uh, yeah yeah right so what we try to do is that we called earlier we used to make diagnosis on the basis of radiology itself and Correct. in the current time where uh, it is very important to know uh, why <coughs> Uh, what are the uh, you know uh, sensitivity pattern of of the bug mm-hmm. there has been a tremendous change in in the way we diagnose tb and therefore x ray based diagnosis is is left for where you don't have a molecular diagnosis correct with that also you look at certain findings which are not pathognomonic but quite common in a high burden disease to be suggesting tb correct they they would include include uh, what we call as highly suggestive and, and a non specific radiology and the highly suggestive radiology is patterns like ehler or media channel lymphadenopathy a chronic uh, fibrocavitary disease or a milledy pattern as mm-hmm. i said these are highly suggestive of tb mm-hmm. and then you have non specific radiology like consolidations inhomogeneous opacities ground glassing or thin walled cavities which which are quite often because of non tb rather than because of tb okay. so sorry to interrupt you dr varinda where does pleural effusion come in this is it suggestive or it is not suggestive it is a non specific radiology okay. because until you tap it and show that it is exudate correct. correct so then uh, you cannot make a diagnosis on that so i that think it's, it is it's a very important message to all those who are listening that pleural effusion is more probably more likely in tuberculosis remember patients with lymphoma and leukemia and malignancies with other round cell tumor also can have pleural effusion people have without tap treated them with akt with steroids for 2 months 3 months and masked the lymphoma and we keep on getting this patient every year at least one or two who are labeled as tb treated empirically just based on pleural effusion without a tapping and 
trying to achieve a diagnosis and then they come back with as a relapse disease. So I think that's an important message that pleural effusion is not highly suggestive. You need to prove it by pleural tapping and ruling out a malignancy by doing a, a what do you call a smear for malignant cells or cyto uh, spin. Go ahead, sir. Very, very important point. Yes. So the first thing which I thought I'll talk about is lymphadenopathy because that's the commonest thing we, we talk of. So right. what are the direct signs by which you can identify lymphadenopathy intrathoracic? It's a sharply demarcated and lobulated density. So as you see in this situation, the right highlight is absolutely rounded. With a, You can see a rounded opacity. You can actually see even a right paratracheal opacity. Sometimes, mm -hmm. it may, if there is periodontitis, it may have ill-defined vague borders, mm -hmm. but it will always obliterate the hilar point. And that mm -hmm. I will uh, talk about this a little later. Right. Other structures making the mediastinum hyalurum can can some can be obscured by it. The other important thing which is there is that you may have indirect signs of a lymphadenopathy. Sometimes the lymphadenopathy uh, may not be uh, visible mm -hmm. uh, directly so clearly. Mm -hmm. So you look at the compression because particularly in older children. As the sternum enlarges, a lot of lymphadenopathy gets hidden behind the sternum or the subcarinal one. So there the impact or the compression by the node, if it is happening, it doesn't mm -hmm. happen in every child, will mm -hmm. help you. So look at the contour and caliber of the trachea or mm -hmm. an impression of the tracheobranchial tree or splaying of carina. And I'll show you some uh, x-rays of that also. So these are the ways we identify lymphadenopathy. And that's uh, something... Uh, Perhaps most of the primary TB looks like that. Correct. So it may not be as decent as in the previous patient, but it may be like this, a lobulated mass. Correct. So you have more than one mass and the, 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 the autopulmonary window is also filled up. Perfect. If you're careful to watch, see, go down this. Is my arrow also visible to people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, are, we can see that. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So as you go down this trachea, this is the right main bronchus, which is so wide. Mm -hmm. And see, you're losing the left main bronchus because of this node here. Perfect. So these are the kind of impressions which can sometimes tell you, oh, oh yeah, this is definitely node. It is not when you're in doubt. But this is some, the trouble is that you may not always have it. Correct. If it is not a well-penetrated view, then also. Then. Or some, something similar to the previous one. Correct. Right? And right paratricular and right hilar nodes. Then... This is part of the Gons complex or primary complex. So you may have lymph node with a peripheral node, uh, uh, parenchyma involvement, and with lymphangitis, lymphatic thickening, and atelectasis. So this Perfect. is a complete uh, Gons complex, but you don't see it uh, very frequently. Correct. More often than not, you will see either a node or a parenchyma lesion. Correct. If you see node, life is easier, because Correct. then that's the commonest reason. Now, one important thing, uh, Nitin Bhai, I would like to say here is... Hmm. When we say lymphadenopathy, it is on X-ray. It is not on CT we are talking. Correct. On CT, all lymph nodes are picked up, even non-diseased. Correct. Much higher resolution. So the fact that you have a pneumonia with lymphadenopathy is likely TB on an X-ray. But if you have a pneumonia with lymphadenopathy on CT, which is small, without any other features of TB, it could be anything. It could even be viral. We saw that in COVID. Correct. So, 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 so sorry to interrupt, Dr. Varinda Singh. Many times the CT people say there is central necrosis. How much credence you give to the central necrosis to suggest TB? On a CT, I'm saying. Yeah, that, that is something which is important. More than necrosis, it's the peripheral rim enhancement because Correct. of periodontitis, which is, which is considered quite suggestive. Correct. In, in, again, it has an epidemiological relationship. I distinctly remember... Mm -hmm. In one of the radiology quiz in, 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 in a pulmonary conference, mm -hmm. the quiz was made by people from Israel, which do, does not see as much TV. <laughs> and they show they, they showed a lymph node, uh, I mean CT picture, where it we all of us, Dr. Seti was there, me, and many, all, many of us, us from big names from <laughs> India, so to say, and we all thought this was TV. And when we mm -hmm. attended the session, he said, is anything but lymphoma. <laughs> so... The epidemiology, there they gave us different logic that this, this rim, so-called rim enhancement, which you are saying is not a rim enhancement, 
all you are saying is a fat around the uh, around the lympho uh, lymphomatous <laughs> lymph node, <laughs> which is very clearly seen, and the lymphomatous in lymph node is homogeneous, and that is appearing like a necrosis. Correct. Right. So Perfect. they had a different explanation for that. So right. Anyway, uh, coming back to this X-ray, which we are dealing right now, so you could have a paratracheal <laughs> node like this. Doctor Ramesh, can you mute yourself, please? You are we are getting noise from your Doctor Ramesh. Sorry, huh? Go ahead, sir. Huh. Yeah. So. You could have a consolidation with the paratracheal node, or sometimes the consolidation may be on the right side and the node may be on the left side because right. the, uh, uh, the lymphatic drainage of the lungs is such. So that's something which we have to remember that uh, they may not necessarily be on the same side. So this is the node and this is the consolidation right. that X-ray and just to show the primary purposes. So here again, uh, you see a large node, which is paratracheal, and you also see as you go down the tracheal caliber is thinning out right. and uh, as also is the right main bronchus. So looking at the airway caliber is something very important. And right. You may say, okay, sir, uh, Dr. Varendra Singh is saying just like that. I'm showing you a bronchus. <laughs> it's totally Perfect. So sometimes you do uh, also do other tests so that, mm -hmm. that helps you. The second, which is easier, is miliary TB, which is mm -hmm. like a, uh, not sparing any part of the lung, millet-like small, thin, you know, millet-like shadows, like a snowstorm. Correct. Uh, not very common in, in, in uh, today's time when we have more computerized radiology, but in the olden times, in, and it may happen still in smaller towns, that if you use those tip old pictures, uh, I mean, the cassettes, and mm. they have cellulose, uh, uh, you know, on, 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 on them, uh, which, that is what holds the radio uh, material, which, mm -hmm. which, which gives us black and white. So if that is kept in a very moist area, humid area, it gets fungus. Correct. And that fungus can give rise to a picture quite similar to miliary. The only difference Correct. being, then your miliary will spill out of the lung fields. Correct. So if your film outside here, like this part is also showing dots, be mm. watchful. That may mm. be a, 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 not necessarily miliary. Correct. We have some, some patients like that. So this is something which is apical. You are seeing loss of volume. This hyla is pulled up, and you are seeing these cavities here. This is mainly this seen in adolescence. This fibrocavitary adolescent. This is adolescent. So fibrocavitary uh, lesions are often seen above eight, seven, eight years of age, and that's where where you start seeing them. So, uh, and these are the patients who actually, uh, if I I look at my subsets, wherever we do microbiological. The possibility of getting a microbiological positivity is like 50, 60 percent. Correct. They, 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 they usually are positive. Correct. So, but one mimicker could be a acute stab or or pneumonia, yeah. but then that would be acute, would not yeah. have fibrotic areas, and spikes the, fever with high counts. The clinical background would be completely different. Very different. Very different. Right. Often these patients, unless until there is destroyed lung, you may find that the chest signs are far less than what you see on X-ray. That's very, very remarkable about TB. That Correct. sometimes your X-ray is worse than what the chest signs which you see on the patient. Correct. So uh, this is the, another one where you have a, a doubtful lymph node here mm -hmm. and you are not able to clearly see the airway. Correct. What more can you do in this, this situation? In these situations, if you do a lateral view, you will see what we call as, I'm sorry, People, if you have not had your meals, I'm talking about donut right now. <laughs> that's what the donut is like. Half right. a donut, which is because of aorta and pulmonary artery, is all, always there. Right. A full donut will come up when there is a subcranial or a major node here with the central hole. So if you see a complete density with the central hole, then this shadow, which you weren't very sure whether it is uh, hyla prominence or not, is something which will tell you on a lateral view. This is, a, is the radiation more on the lateral than on an AP uh, for the child? About three, it has to be because you are going to bigger thickness of the Correct. chest. About three times more. Okay, fine. That's okay. That's not. So this is again another donut, and uh, <laughs> typically in a lateral view, I'm showing this because of another reason. Uh, mm -hmm. This area, which is just behind the sternum, and this area, which is behind the heart, usually are equilucent. Correct. It, if you have thymus, which can be one of the confounders for the paratracheal node, then mm -hmm. this part would be white. 
Correct. And if you have lower lobe disease, which is behind the heart, which may not be so clearly seen on a frontal view, this area will be. Correct. So this is additional advantage of a lateral view. Correct. Okay. Fine. Yes. Uh, here is another one, which looks like to us that there is a node or not, and both of these were referred to us for TV management. But what I'm trying Correct. to show mm -hmm. here is that see the difference. Mm -hmm. This is a concavity outside. You can clearly mark, and here it is absolutely rounded one. Correct. Okay. But here also, is it part of the? Is it obscuring the lymph node or not? One has, would, I would go ahead and do a lateral view, and here I would not bother. Correct. So, remember, a lot of visas would have increased bronchovascular markings. So, looking at the pattern of this hilum is very important, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we we also make mistakes like this girl with a chronic cough, thin build, build uh, and Montu positive, and somebody felt there was a right paratracheal node. But what actually happened was it is a rotated one. See this level standing here, and this is this so-called paratracheal node is actually ending. With a very sharp bony mar margin just at the level of the clavicle. So it's a clav sternoclavicular joint, and this is the body of sternum, which is just peeping out because it's a rotated film. And this sometimes this was reported by a radiologist as a paratric, you know. Which yeah. is fine. In a younger child, uh, thymus can also look like this. Right. So this sale sign? Sale sign? Yes. Yeah, this is sale sign. So normal, a lot of variations. So Correct. you could have a sale sign like this, you could have a, a globose or all kind of that. How can you differentiate? One way is that you do a lateral view. Correct. And other way is that you can even, if it is large enough, you can do an okay. ultrasound. And that typically shows a star in sky appearance. Correct. So that's so, the films. Correct. So thank you, Dr. Varinder. That's an excellent collection. The maestro speaks and I think people understand. I'm so happy that when we were residents almost 40 years back, we used to see the same type of X-rays and make out the differences. Uh, we used to also that time, Dr. I remember Dr. Udani's father, PM Udani, the great PM Udani used to say about the subcranial uh, widening and I think that still holds true. That's so great. I mean, they didn't have even an ultrasound that time. Forget about a CT scan. And a lot of credence was given to the Right oblique fissure opacified, suggesting that there is something happening, uh, a bones lesion there. So these are the ways we should diagnose that time. But uh, still, these clinical clues are continuing, and I'm I think I'm so very happy. So now Nitin, we have Nitin. Yes. Can I can I say a few yeah, words? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, you talked about the uh, necrosis on uh, CT on scan. We yes. know about inter observer variation in X-ray imaging and uh, reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have had a very bad experience even on CT. Mm -hmm. There are no opinions with CT reported as uh, necrosis and you mm -hmm. take the film or uh, the CD to some other radiologist says no, that is not like necrosis. No, so, I understand wonder, that, Vijay, uh, but, but generally yeah, our experience wonder, is... What would be your comments? I mean, do you have you come across such, uh, you know, discrepancies? Oh, yes, absolutely. The, this, is, this is something... You see, mm -hmm. the, the trouble also is partly us. We give no information to our radiologist. We mm. just write fever, cough. And the poor chap sitting in that room, whatever he sees, tries to give some weightage to that finding, even yeah. if it is normal, because he thinks that clinician is in at, at a loss and, and they, they want to help him. I would say that this inter-observer variation is as much important in, in CT. There are published literatures on this. A yeah. very beautiful paper from, from South Africa, where they said that the degree of agreement, even on CT, was not more than 60%. Correct. So, like, that's a toss. And yeah. very bad on ultrasound. So, right. recurrent abdominal pain with that small amount of fluid or thickening on the bowel wall or whatever comes your way is more often than not a, a normal finding or a finding, non-specific finding, because of so common enteric infections rather than because of TB. Correct. But I'll tell you our experience that I, I deal with so many onco patient and you know these lymph nodes are always a problem of Hodgkin's versus uh, a TB. I mean if you have a lymphoma which is a mediastinal T cell is a large mass. No one can miss it. But these small lymph nodes. But they're generally accurately they would say they know this looks like a very solid. It will turn out to be Hodgkin and low and behold on biopsy it will. We are not saying that based on the necrosis no necrosis you diagnose. But it helps you to at least little sort of uh, be a uh, little lenient about what's going to happen to the patient. So I think we have no, discussed there is, that. There is, there yes, is absolutely no doubt that these modalities are good. 
Correct. But these modalities alone are not good. You need also good radiologists, just like one you have. But <laughs> with current time, with tele teleradiology, every small oh, town uh, getting reported anywhere, these reports are, I mean, I'm not uh, uh, bragging <laughs> here, but we more often than not, not look at the report uh, given and look at the film first and then go back to it. So I completely agree with you, Dr. Varindar, that I mean, I'm not again boasting because I'm in Hinduja. I'm sure it's the same with many of the major hospitals, but people come with CT done in peripheral places which are suboptimal. There is hardly anything that you can make out and you repeat and a completely different picture emerges. So I think CT, when you uh, interpret, is also important as to where and who has done the CT, not only the person who is looking at it. Dr. Sushant, you want to add something? So this is one point. Another point what we have, because this is a general pediatrician's group, what we have seen commonly is for what CT was done. We have had referrals where the child was diagnosed to be a bacterial pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Seven days or eight days because fever was not going, CT was done. Mm -hmm. And CT showed lymph nodes and referred to me, now this is TB. <laughs> so again, you know, the background of the patient, you know, CTs are done okay. very frequently. For Correct. bacterial pneumonia, X-ray repeated on seventh day, doing something, do a CT. Fever not going to a city. So then Correct. we are into more trouble than uh, anything else. Correct. So I think we have so far come to a clinical suspicion where he rightly pointed out Dr. Yevle. We won't repeat it. We said Mantu is almost out because of non specificity. Igra may be just to diagnose the latent infection, but not to prove disease. X ray is a mainstay in pulmonary tuberculosis in children. And there are X rays shown by Dr. Varinder which are highly suggestive and which are not suggestive. In any case, the diagnosis of TB is not complete unless you attempt and actually become successful for bacteriological diagnosis. And I think that is a major fulcrum change from what we used to practice when we were residents based on an MT and a child symptomatic, we would put them on AKT. Many of them might have been overtreated, but now we say attempt bacterial diagnosis, whether it is pulmonary TB or extra pulmonary TB. So I think the last major chunk on the diagnosis is on how to diagnose, uh, I mean, how to achieve this bacterial yes. diagnosis. So we say a presumptive yes. TB, a confirmed TB, and a completed okay. diagnosis. And the confirmed would be to say that it is TB on bacteriological diagnosis, and completed will be to say whether it is or it is not drug-sensitive or drug-resistant TB. So I think the next uh, eight or nine questions uh, will be on diagnosis. Dr. Ramesh Bajaniya, you can yes. start with the next question. Yes, sir. Yes, Vijay Bhai. Now, yeah. uh, they said that you can induce the sputum, but we have seen in our pediatric age group that it's a difficult thing. Then how to induce sputum and any special precautions? Uh, while so, so, so one minute, uh, Dr. Yabla. Can I show the video first and then you can discuss the video? Yeah, yeah. Please, All right. Sir. Let me share my screen. And... Okay. One minute. So, uh, you, are to, uh, you are talking about induced sputum first or the gastric lavage first? The induced sputum, okay. Sputum. Here is a, okay, here is a video. Please look at carefully. I would urge you to, to look at this video carefully. Requires access to respiratory specimen. <laughs> In adults, it's simple because they can bring up sputum and give it voluntarily. However, children often tend to swallow it and are not able to produce sputum at volition or command. This makes collection of respiratory specimen little difficult in children. How does one access specimen in children with these difficulties? There are two ways it can be done. One way is by inducing sputum and collecting it through nasopharynx, or the other way is to collect it through the gastric aspirate. The first method, which is called induction of sputum, is largely used for children who either are not producing any sputum or are very young and are swallowing it up. In this situation, we prime them with a dose of salbutamol and follow it up with a 3% hypertonic saline nebulization. Priming is necessitated because 3% hypertonic saline can provoke bronchoconstriction in some children. To avoid that, we give them salbutamol either by nebulization or by MDI with spacer. After initial priming with salbutamol, 3% hypertonic saline is given by nebulization. This pr stimulates production of secretions in the respiratory passages. An older child 
may be able to cough out these loosened secretion on its own <coughs> during the process of 3% hypertonic saline nebulization, while a younger child may need further assistance. For loosening of these secretions, in a younger child, one may have to do chest percussion. Even after chest percussion, a younger child, when he coughs up the sputum, will tend to swallow it. So how does one trap these secretions before they are swallowed by the child? One way to do it is to use a suction trap attached to either a suction machine or a wall suction port. The suction trap, when it is introduced into the nasopharynx of the child, stimulates cough. So as the loosened secretions come into the nasopharynx, before the child has a chance to swallow it, it is trapped by the suction and collected in the suction trap. This way, one can access the loosened secretion after inducing them with hypotonic saline. Explain the procedure and take consent from the parent or guardian. Patient should be fasting for 2-3 to three hours prior to collection procedure. Instruments required for the procedure are Disposable gloves Hypertonic 3% saline Syringe 10 ml size Needle Adhesive tape Sterile specimen container Sterile gauze cotton Nebulization chamber with oxygen tubing and mask Salbutamol and mucus extractor or suction trap. Procedure should be performed in a well-ventilated room having an exhaust fan while wearing a N95 face mask. Baseline values of respiratory rate, pulse rate, chest retractions, wheeze and oxygen saturation should be taken prior to the procedure. Priming with salbutamol can either be done through metered dose inhaler that is MDI or nebulization using either respiratory solution or respule. MDI has an advantage that it takes less time and is as effective as nebulization. However, nebulization facility is essential to give 3% hypertonic saline. Instruments required for this procedure are inhaler and spacer. A mask is attached to spacer in case of a young child. Salbutamol is administered by sequentially giving two puffs, that is 100 micrograms through MDI with a spacer. This prevents bronchospasm from 3% hypertonic saline nebulization in children predisposed to it. Alternatively, administer salbutamol by nebulization using respiratory solution or respule. The NEB respirator solution contains 5 mg of salbutamol per ml. The dosage for administration is 0.15 mg per kg. Taking age into consideration, the administered dosage varies as shown on the screen. For NEB respule, use equivalent doses as respirator solution. Fill up the required amount of salbutamol from respiratory solution or respule. Load the drug formulation to the nebulization chamber. Add saline if required to ensure that volume of formulation in the chamber is above its minimal fill volume as shown. The next step 
is to nebulize with 5 ml of 3% sterile hypertonic saline. Use a sterile commercially available preparation. Nebulization can be done through a jet nebulizer attached to pressured oxygen or air supply at the lowest flow rate needed to produce adequate mist which usually is 5 to 7 liters per minute. While the child is being nebulized, give a container to the child to collect any expectorated sputum. As evident, this child has started expectorating while being nebulized with 3% saline. If the sample is adequate, then the procedure may be wrapped here and expectoration may be sent to lab for further processing. The characteristics of good sputum specimen are desirable quantity of 3 to 5 ml, presence of mucoid or mucopurulent material, color varies from opaque white to green, should be brought up from inside the chest by a deep cough and should not be oropharyngeal secretion or saliva. Few children will only produce or bring up saliva or no expectoration on their own after 3% hypertonic saline nebulization. In such situations, one can loosen up secretions and assist child in secreting sputum by chest percussion. The purpose of chest percussion is to bring the secretions from the peripheral to central airways from where the child can cough out the secretions. Palm of the hands while doing percussion should be made into a cup shape formed by the fingers and the thumb instead of a flat open hand. This avoids hurting the child. For younger children, it is ideal to percuss with fingers. Movement while percussion should be at the wrist and not elbow or shoulder. For percussion, we must cover all areas of chest in sitting, supine and prone positions. If there is sputum production and child can expectorate, collect this sputum in sterile container. If still child is unable to expectorate or if it is a young child who needs assistance to collect secretions, then sputum can be collected by suction through nasopharynx or oropharynx. Use sterile mucus extractor or suction trap with the other end of the extractor connected to gentle suction of around 100 cm of water. The catheter is inserted through the nose. The length of the tube to be inserted is measured from side of the nose to the angle of the mandible. Apply lubricant jelly or wet the tube. A few children get scared, however, this procedure is not painful as evident in another patient. The catheter is gently inserted into the nose in a direction perpendicular to the face. Release suction. As the catheter touches the posterior pharyngeal wall, it can provoke cough. 
the loosened secretions are brought up with the cough and suction will facilitate its collection in mucus extractor or suction trap in this child as you can see respiratory secretions have been collected this should be immediately transported to gene expert lab monitor for 30 minutes after the procedure for respiratory complaints like respiratory rate pulse rate chest retractions wheeze etc fresh sterile disposable tubing and chamber for nebulization should be used for each patient so you learned that for induction of sputum first step is to prime with salbutamol either by using mdi or nebulization using respiratory solution or respue followed by nebulization with 3% hypertonic saline if no expectoration chest wall percussion is done if still no expectoration collect sputum by suction through nasopharynx or oropharynx 50 ml conical tube is another type of container which can be used for sample transport instead of the disposable container shown in the video as conical tube can be put directly into centrifuge machine it is preferred when the sample is to be subjected to mycobacterial culture and drug sensitivity this is also the preferred container for samples being sent to national tv program labs as it does away the need to transfer the specimen from one container to another Well, I think uh, it's a beautiful 1230 oh, yeah. video which should clarify. I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people would have not tried, but now they would try. These videos are available Definitely. online. I will put the link uh, in the chat box. And if anyone is still uh, wanting, they can. They are freely downloadable from the government side. So now, Dr. Vijay, anything you want to add to this? Uh, no, the thing is, first of all, thank you, Nitin and Ramesh, for agreeing to show this video. <laughs> TB is an infectious disease and one needs to have a microbiological diagnosis. And this is an underutilized uh, tool. And I'm sure with this uh, video and uh, uh, the skills uh, would be put to practice by all the viewers and we improve the diagnostics in TB. Thank you. Thank you for putting And I don't think I need to answer anything now. It was so uh, well. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Varindran. Dr. Kamal, I think, was there in the video. Yes. And right. Beautifully. <laughs> Sushant. It was self-explanatory, yes. yes. Sushant, what about gastric lavage? The commonest thing that a pediatrician actually does is gastric lavage. And a lot of confusion, fasting, early morning, admit, not admit, how many samples, when to test, how to take, etc. Can you throw some light? So, uh, first I will answer the sample question. Whether we are taking an induced sputum or we are taking a gastric lavage, uh, it is always recommended to send two samples. Okay, the reason being, the first sample is run for CBNAT. And once the CBNAT is positive, the second sample would be taken invariably for culture. That is the program protocol under NGP. Mm -hmm. In general, pediatric is considered to be a high risk population along with, you know, people living with HIV or extra pulmonary TB. So even if the CBNAT report comes as negative, then also automatically the second sample will be taken for culture. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important concept where if we are sending the samples through the program NTEP, this will be done. However, if you are sending it to a private lab, accredited lab, for example, Hinduja is an accredited lab, mm -hmm. they would have to specify that we want a CBNAT and we also want to culture because right. it will be charging differently for both the tests. So this right. and, and there are two do samples on two different days? No, we can take it on the same day. Okay. So ideally, two different days would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Get an early morning and a spot sample or you take a, something like that. But suppose... Right. If traveling from a long long distance and it is not feasible for the patient to come again on the second day, then mm -hmm. it is better, okay if we take two samples two hours apart. That okay. also is Okay. One thing what we must uh, know is uh, it should be taken on a fasting stomach, at least four to six hours of fasting. So initially we used to say overnight fasting or 12 hours fasting is not required because we can't keep the children fasting for so long time. Correct. So four to six hours fasting is enough if we want to do a gastric aspirate. Mm -hmm. And as possible whatever the sample try to reach the lab as early as possible mm -hmm. within uh, three to four hours of collection if by any chance there is an undue delay for example the most common delay is if the patient comes to us at odd hours in the evening or the night okay then we can collect the sample and keep it in the refrigerator 
mm-hmm. at one to four degrees centigrade, and immediately the next day, as soon as the lab opens, we can send the sample to the lab. Correct. So there are beautiful videos also on the gastric lavage. For the lack of time, probably we will not show that. People are known, but they can. Yes, Varinder, please unmute, unmute. So uh, just to add a couple of things, this uh, thing which Sushant very correctly mentioned about two samples has, uh, you know, some of us who are oldies have to unlearn few things. <laughs> so two samples, two samples for sputum, which was before when we were in Z and Smear era. Was a standard, so morning or or, or or early morning specimen and a spot specimen, and both were tested, right? Here mm. it is not same. Here two yeah. samples are for two different purposes. Correct. One sample goes for a CBNAT. If it comes positive, fine. You require it will go for further testing. The other sample is for culture purposes. So we are not doing two CBNAT tests. Correct. Because the sensitivity of CBNAT is much higher. However, a repeat CBNAT another day may be required where, where you have a, a, either a reason to believe that you have missed the first time, the quality was not good, or it was drug resistance, or, or you still want to confirm it only in those. So the difference is the cost is huge from 50 rupees to 2000 rupees. So you can't be testing every specimen, you are clogging the labs. Correct. So that's an important difference. So but what about smear, Dr. Vadida? You would also want to do a smear, right? So that will need two days of specimen for two, both this specimen will be up subject to smear. Yeah, smear is if if you get a smear positive, the advantage is you can put an LPA, LPA. directly. Exactly, on exactly. And that is what gives you uh, information on on uh, INH. It is gives you information on in first line. So that's something uh, a, a a different ball game. But then a large proportion of of our patients. Uh, 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 are, are not the one who will actually be smear positive when you talk of primary no, disease. No, that I understand, Dr. Vajay, but with the standard of care, when I send a sample, I write uh, uh, team for, for uh, AFB, for CBNAT, and for culture. When I send on two yeah. different days, or lab, of course, will do only one CBNAT, two smears, and one culture. Is that okay? Is that That's okay. That's okay, fine. All right. I have a All right. question. Yes, have yes, a yes, question. yes. Yes, please, please. There was a discussion where... Uh, uh, we also suggested that uh, in the same sitting, one could make an attempt to have induced sputum followed by gastric aspirate. So that whatever mm-hmm. the sputum that is produced, the child mm-hmm. swallows and that can also be retrieved. by. Uh, so, uh, Varindar, how much is the improvement in the yield with this kind of manure? So, we have uh, looked at this uh, in a different context where we were pooling the two specimens. You induce sputum, you pool them together. Uh, uh, the the one or the other specimen adds about 20% extra. So you miss by first or the second specimen about 20% which the other one will pick up. So that's more on quality of specimen. It's not a homogeneous thing. So right. uh, that's the advantage of actually a second specimen. It's harder to say uh, whether it is GA versus IS. However, I see no harm in in, in following what you're doing and we often do that in our practice. Correct. So Vijay, that brings us to the question. Now that you have collected the sample, what do you subject it to? Gene expert. So what is the sensitivity of gene expert, specificity in sputum, in plural fluid, and CSF or in tissues? Okay. The gene expert, uh, which is carried out, is uh, a closed system. And uh, the sensitivity, if one really wants to compare, you need to have a Gold standard to come. Yeah, the gold standard is culture. Let's standard take that. Culture. So, hmm. in culture positive samples, say for sputum, if your smear is 30 per, uh, you know, 30 percent sensitive, gene export is 90 percent. Correct. So your gastric aspirate is about 60 70 percent sensitive. Hmm. As- and uh, what is this gene export gene extra? Gene export extra. Extra is uh, uh, ultra, you are talking about. Uh, sorry, not extra, ultra. Yeah, ultra. See the uh, conventional standard gene expert. The limit of detection is to the tune of about 130 bacilli. Correct. And that ultra would pick up as little as 10 to 16 uh, bacilli. Correct. So, so should you ask for ultra because, always, or you first do a expert and then that's negative? Because that increased sensitivity comes uh, at little lesser specificity than ultra. But yes, in pediatric TB, especially uh, in children living with uh, HIV positive, uh, I mean with HIV or extra pulmonary TB, uh, 
one could really ask for ultra. So why am I asking is this question is because, you know, in private labs, the cost is different and they are charged for both the tests. So the lab sometimes insists that you, you write both. Uh, we say, no, you first do an uh, expert. If it's negative, then you do ultra. So, I mean, what's the algorithm in that? I mean, in is it program, in the program? It is the no, not in the program, in the private yeah. lab. Many people will not be sending to general hospitals, right? Many people will be sending to private hospitals. And that's where the question of cost always comes. So, first of all, I have a very solid foundation of having a good presumptive TB diagnosis. Made so, on that all is true. Now, the specimen is collected. That, having said that, one would subject it to... Uh, uh, for pulmonary uh, and you get a good quality sputum, your gene expert should uh, suffice. It should Correct. suffice. Uh, whereas you have a precious sample, say extra pulmonary TB or a CNS, maybe one could ask for ultra. Expert. All right. Specificity of gene expert? Forget the ultra. Oh, specificity okay. is almost 100%. Okay. And what about it's the sensitivity good. in other it's fluids? A, it's a good ruling test, but a negative uh, would not uh, rule Perfect. out the body. That, that, that of course... And that is there in the algorithm. Sensitivity would also vary from specimen to specimen. I talked okay. about sput. In no, two fluid. Labs, also, it is good. Fluid, it is suboptimal, say less than 50%. Okay. So, CSF? CSF, it is excellent. CSF, lymph node biopsy, uh, you know, aspirates, the sensitivity is extremely good. So, can However, you subject tissues which are collected in the form of biopsy? It would require a processing, mm -hmm. but uh, the sensitivity is very good. No, but it can be subjected to gene expert. So yes. gene expert is not only on the liquid material, yes. it's also on the yes. solid biopsy. Uh -huh. So I think, uh, and uh, many times the mistake is done that, uh, you know, a lymph node biopsy is done by a surgeon and the sister puts everything in formalin. That okay. kills the whole thing of doing culture. Can you still do gene expert on a formalin sample? Formalin sample, gene expert can because it can, can detect be dead bacilli, but the yield would be a little less okay. than uh, done in line. Dr. Varindu was raising his hand. when. Yes, Dr. Varindu, please add. So the only, only thing, I, I totally agree with what uh, Vijay said, uh, except uh, some supplementation to his answer is that your, your question was that should I subject first to uh, yes. uh, gene expert and then to ultra? Uh, no, you don't have to. You can go uh, directly with ultra. But remember, ultra is not approved by NTEP. Okay, fine. Why? Why? The reason being, if the ex increased positivity is because of trace, these trace results are mm. something which which create confusion. Okay. So this is a very good test, but the specificity of the test goes down for MTB when they are trace results. One, that is what is important. Right. So, Second important thing is, yeah. when it is a trace result, you cannot rely on the rifampicin resistant value. Mm. If it says rifampicin resistant detected, and there are no risk factors in that patient, then you better be careful because it may just be a wrong alarm. Correct. And that is something very important. Correct. However, for certain very precious, you know, extra pulmonary sample, which are possible, like CSF, mm. like uh, psoas abscess, if somebody can afford and are, are, would go for an ultra, I would not st stop them. But again, Correct. with the rider, be watchful about the trace results. Trace Correct. results can actually take you off the track. They're not always negative, but they can't. I mean, like you can swear upon a gene expert test if it is up to very low, irrespective of whether it is test A or test B, which means ultra or non-ultra, right? When it no, goes to trace, you can't be sure about MTB. No, so that's why my first uh, uh, question was that, you know, you do a, a gene expert, if it's negative, then only do ultra, especially for CSF and other tissues. Sometimes that... you may not have to, you may not have that many, that much specimen. Hmm. No, if you have space, like CSA, we all normally collect and keep 10 ml for pyro sequencing and if so many have, things. If you yes. have that, then that's an added okay. cost because so, you don't have an added advantage. Correct. You see, correct. the trace will never be picked up by a gene expert. Correct. It will not be. Correct. So you have no added advantage of running it once. So that brings me back to you, Dr. Varinda. That now that you have got the gene expert and the report comes, how do you interpret R sensitive, R resistant? Sometimes it's indeterminate. Now, what do you do with all these three scenarios? So, R indeterminate means test does not know. It does not mean partially sensitive. Correct. We often, you know, draw connotations, I mean, draw parallels uh, uh, with the uh, pyogenic reports where it is intermediate sensitive. And we call, consider this the same as indeterminate. No, it is not. When the test is saying indeterminate, it's because of its technological issue a technical issue that it is not able to comment on the riff resistance at all 
and it is related to the city values which we became so familiar with covid so covid time yeah right. so let me give you three scenarios dr varinda you have r sensitive does it mean it's a drug sensitive could it could it be also ionized resistant steel or some other drug do you test them on an lpa when the culture comes positive and start them on first line or you don't do anything just give them first line and see for response no we we do not have if i do not have a smear positive where i cannot do a direct lpa correct i i can't wait for four to six weeks to start therapy correct if it is rif sensitive i treat it as drug sensitive correct four weeks if i still getting difficulty and patient is not responding i look at amongst other reasons whether it was tv not tv etc et correct i also correct. look at whether it there is drug resistance which is non rif ampersand kind correct which but by then your dst i mean your the culture cultures will is... come and your cultures will give you the So if it's positive, you do a first line, second line LP, and then that's yeah, that's the end. That culture, yeah. Correct. And you will get now it. the the second scenario you have show it shows R a typical R resistant. Now what do you do? If I see R resistance, I will always ask for a complete answer, and the complete report is not only R R resistant detected. It should be what was the bacillary load in terms of whether it was it, it is always a semi quantitative test. So MTB detected. high low medium very low low or trace in case of ultra mm -hmm. trace is not there for non ultra test mm -hmm. so if i if i get very low with non ultra test mm -hmm. or trace with ultra test and then i get a rif resistance mm -hmm. then i will be very doubtful about this and i will repeat the test except repeat for the, the circumstances except for the circumstances where my pre pre test probability of rif resistance is very high like a patient who is when you considering rif resistance in a contact with mdr tb yeah contact with mdr a failure or a relapse or a, relapse, or a correct or a patient who is not taken treatment properly yeah. now you, if your repeat test is discordant what do you correct. do in that shit hmm. so if your repeat test is discordant as drug sensitive tb is commoner than drug resistance you treat as drug sensitive and and wait for your cultures to be the tie breaker correct now suppose you had an r sensitive okay and you started and the culture came positive now your lp shows that is ionized resistant so you drop the drug and add another drug or just continue the patient responding it is preferable to change inh okay and strengthen it with liver fluxus liver fluxus okay And, so we'll and, come to that when we discuss that's therapy. That's a uniphasic, and that's a uniphasic regime. Correct. That's correct. important. So we'll but discuss that in detail in the maybe part maybe two maybe next maybe week. Maybe one yeah. quick clarification from Varun. Yes, Vijay. Yes, please. Because if you have rift sensitive TB and your culture grows something, you subject it to full sensitivity of only INH. Okay. Do you test for second line? Uh, you also? do first line LPA, right? No, so you you do for only first line because you are not planning to use. The, mm. But the thing is, sometimes you get into trouble. You get hmm. an INH resistance, then you want to know fluoroquinone resistance. Then yeah. you have to do second line LPA. Yeah. So particularly if this patient is from, say, Delhi or Bombay, where the background fluoroquinone resistance is much higher than rest of the country, uh, you are in trouble. So sometimes you need both. Yeah, but the, even your phenotyping DST would take at least two weeks, right? So you can do first line LPA, second line LPA next three or four days, and then still come to some conclusion till the time yeah. you get your full DST, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, and the last scenario was that you have indeterminate. Now the patient is otherwise not at risk of MDR TB. You would still treat them in a first line. But if the patient yeah. is in contact, then you would probably err on the other side. Am I correct? Yeah, that's All right. right. All right. So I think we have I think we are very clear on how to interpret the rifampicin sensitive resistance etc. on the gene expert. As Dr. Arvindar said, please do not rely on the ultra for that, especially with the trace report. It should be a proper uh, expert with showing you uh, one of the others. Okay. So, Dr. Vijay, uh, we already answered the expert ultra, and can it help uh, broaden the MDR diagnosis? No, it just gives you a more sensitivity, but at the uh, at the cost of being less specific. Am I correct? Yes. What is the specificity of ultra? is your no. is almost 100% this will be uh, as i said it would depend on what you get say for example right. this you would be uh, would not give much credence unless you take the whole uh, picture into consideration in totality perfect so now sushan dst you have uh, done all this you are done you started as per what the algorithms now your cultures have come positive you uh, you do a full dst 14 drugs because everything is expensive there are packages only first line so much second line so much combined so much etc how do you go about in the dst 
so no so as we as we just discuss most of the things are discussed so i'll just briefly touch if we have a resource insensitive hmm. we know that we are dealing with a drug sensitive tuberculosis hmm. interested in h sensitivity because a subset of population in india now which is h mono resistant correct 35% which h mono mm-hmm. so as per the program they will do an h sensitivity that is a first line lpa and correct. the h is showing resistance mm. either by molecular or by the conventional dst then mm-hmm. we are going ahead doing a quinolone a pyrazinamide because then we are going to replace the drugs which we will discuss in the h mono we will be using quinolones or linezolid something like that so mm-hmm. as far as the pharmacist sensitive reports are concerned we would be first doing only for h h which is there uh, the dst if right. we have pharmacist resistance again, so, so so one minute uh, for the better clarity for the people who may not be very well versed with tb diagnostic treatment your culture is con positive the lab will first flag you that your culture is positive contact your doctors the patient yes. will come running to you yes. hinduja typically they'll come with running with a big paper of codein drugs yes. but i should order the first line lpa first especially the patient first has responded line. and was originally rifampicin sensitive correct first i do not dnh resistant i don't do anything further yeah and as sir said if we are in high resistance settings of quinolones like delhi and mumbai we would be obvious uh, ordering a second line to see for quinolone but we are not using quinolone in that child because is anyway only on no. first time so right if there is h resistance we would be no, i'm saying are sensitive and a culture h, comes h, positive h. if it is an h resistance we would be using a quinolone correct so first is yeah. uh, first line uh, uh, yes. lpa yes. ins yes. sensitive just leave it there yes so the ins yes. resistant do second line yes. and look at quinolone if that also resistant order for the full dst phenotypic yes. to see which are the best drugs yes is Absolutely. is everyone agreeable to this type of algorithm so that you don't waste too much money at the same time also don't overburden the labs for doing a phenotypic dst which is a very cumbersome procedure and at the end if suppose both lps show resistance then you have no other choice but to do the full 14 drug dst to select the best uh, drug which are possible that all right doc yeah sorry one, uh, if both are showing resistance then we o- o- order a complete dst another yeah. situation where we, we are having a patient who has already been treated correct okay i with a drug especially with a drug resistant regimens and Correct. he has failed the regimen or he was a defaulter he has co- come back to us Correct. in such difficult situations we would be wanting a complete dst Correct. because there if we, when we go into the uh, regimens we have a standard oral longer regimen the standard regimen does not work we have I to individualize the regimen as per the as per the patient there would be needing a complete dst so uh, am i correct to say that such patients pediatricians should then just refer to higher center instead of breaking their head into going into what next to do what drug to etc because such patient if they are treated haphazardly especially if they have mdr if they xdr a relapse etc they will do more mess and our time is wasted in correct in choosing the correct di- uh, treatment rather than you know they playing because they have very limited experience yes. is that a fair deal dr varinder Yes. All right. Right. all right. So, Doctor Varin, the the LPA detects all INS resistance only or some mutation like all mutations or INS resistance are picked up on LPA first and say for quinolones for the LPA second line or like is it sacrosanct? Uh, LPA INS is about eighty five percent. Eighty five percent. So it may still miss twenty percent of resistance. I mean, there there it is improving with more and more resistance being made. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it's not as robust as you have for rifampicin because mm-hmm. there are two different uh, uh, genes which are involved, Correct. and there are also other mechanisms which are not. I mean, not necessarily by INHA or CAD gene, Correct. which are non-specific. Correct. So, like an efflux pump, um, uh, you know, uh, things like that. So Correct. they they are not routinely picked up, but but uh, they will be picked up on the phenotypic DST. Yeah, they will be picked up on phenotypic. So that is why more... phenotypic remains the gold standard. Correct, right. So that also brings uh, back to you, Doctor Varinder, that we do in C, uh, we do in Hinduja pyro sequencing for CSF at least. Now th- we are also extending it to some other materials. So what is this pyro sequencing vis-a-vis uh, gene expert, and how is more sensitive specific, especially for CNS tuberculosis? So you see, it is pyro sequencing is something. Uh, like a uh, uh, NGS, Correct. not exactly. Mm-hmm. Is, when we say gene expert, we're talking of something like a, a, a limited genome and limited type of mutations. Correct. And when you are doing pyro sequencing, you are looking at many, much many, much many, many, many more probes, 
and mm. the other difference is here the signal is by increased atp production like a fluorescent signal Correct. instead of a color segment you get and that is why it is called pyro sequencing because mm -hmm. based on atp mm -hmm. uh, it's it's still not a step i mean very recently the who mm -hmm. has brought out a, 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 a complete booklet on diag rapid diagnosis mm -hmm. and they are also they have not said the final thing on pyro sequencing Correct. it still remains with few labs hinduja being one of them but uh, it still remains with very few labs and uh, in the you see just to go back to the history of pcr today for last 5 years we are talking so much about molecular methods mm -hmm. while the T tb pcr came when in in 1980s why why is for 25 years 30 years 40 years we were not talking about it mm -hmm. it's not just the pcr it is the way that pcr is done and perfected. standardization of those imperfection and the lab contamination correct which got perfected correct. so same questions remain around pyro sequencing which the, if the rigor is not there with every lab it will have mm -hmm. difficulty however uh, in a when you have your back to the wall and you have a specimen you have nowhere to go uh, it may give you some clue but correct. it it i would take it with a with 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 with, with a, uh, a kind of a caveat that okay it is still something which has to come from a good Correct. So, so we have done a small study in uh, Hinduja, and especially for the CSF and uh, in, uh, the gold standard being culture, and we have found that the sensitivity is as high as ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent. The specificity is almost ninety-eight point five percent, which means in a patient with uh, some encephalitis, meningitis, CNS picture confusing, and your pyro sequence is negative for TB, it sorts of almost be can be little re reassuring that is you are unlikely to be dealing with TB. So. Pyro sequencing has really helped us crack some of the patient uh, uh, as far as the CNS TB is concerned. But I take your point; it's still not a standard of care, and I'm sure more and more samples are done by more lab. Probably will be more wiser, and it may become the thing of tomorrow. Especially when your gene expert uh, has a poor sensitivity uh, for uh, CSF and other body fluids. We have discussed for one and a half hours TB diagnosis. We are on the last two questions, and I think after that we will stop, as we said, and we will probably discuss the therapeutic as a part two of this panel. I will declare the date uh, in due course of time, but probably we will do it earlier, maybe the next week, so that everyone has a fresh knowledge and not do a month after because you know the link will be broken. So the last two question, Dr. Ramesh Bai, if you can take on the plural biopsy, yeah, yeah. lymph node biopsy, and the other on the abdominal TB. then we wind up this session yes uh, vijay, vijay sir hmm. uh, role of plural biopsy so plural effusion is always a diagnostic dilemma mm -hmm. so he said that uh, obtaining the sample is not so difficult however the yield of gene expert is uh, suboptimal uh, just on the fluid you are saying on the fluid on the fluid yeah so as we said you must uh, do imaging and try and look at uh, other uh, you know evidence of tuberculosis like in the uh, form of mediastinal lymphadenitis mm -hmm. You can still perform uh, obtain sputum sample either by mm -hmm. IAS or by stick lavage. Correct. Uh, what in private practice we do, which is not offered in the program uh, so often, is uh, pleuroscopy. Do a CT, uh, do a pleural biopsy by doing a pleuroscopy, or Correct. even with a pleural biopsy, little one can do it. Then you do a tissue sample where the gene expression sensor is much higher. So there you uh, hit uh, randomly or under CT guided where there is a lesion. In in uh, blind needle biopsy, you hit randomly. Correct. Plural, uh, the flexible pleuroscopy. Pleuroscope. Yeah. Uh, you do it under vision. Under vision, perfect. But you what about lymph node? And, uh, you need uh, an. Which is what about lymph node biopsy? Lymph node biopsy again. There is a uh, standard algorithm. You lymph node biopsy. You can make an attempt to do a fine needle aspiration as a screening tool. If it is negative, then you can uh, go ahead and do a. Biopsy and biopsy would definitely be much better and higher than your FNC. Uh, so Sushant, if I can uh, uh, further qualify that, suppose you have a peripheral lymph node which is easily accessible, maybe an excision biopsy which is not in that difficult thing. If it's a deep like chest or ma abdominal, do a, a, a CT guided biopsy which is like a needle biopsy rather than uh, just doing an FNC. At least in center where this is possible. Correct or not correct? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. As we just discussed, biopsy is going to give us good yield, correct. and sometimes the tissue is good enough, so we divide the tissue. One section yes. goes for micropathology, and another goes for microbiology. So, so a, a 
a point yeah. for all the people who are listening today that when you subject to lymph node biopsy you are not doing you ask your surgeon please do not put the thing in the formalin put it in saline send the entire mass to the laboratory they will divide into between them for gene expert for culture for smear whatever once you put in <laughs> in formalin you have really lost a great opportunity to do culture so i think please don't and we have people have done mistake and then they take out of the formalin put it in saline not knowing that the lab can still smell the formalin in the lymph node biopsy when it reaches there so please don't do it and uh, do not uh, subject the lymph node into a formalin just put it in saline the last question of today dr ramesh bhai uh, that's to dr sushant na yes. uh, role of role of ust ct or biopsy in abdominal tuberculosis i mean abdominal is tuberculosis is coming in a big way sushant yeah. how do you yeah. diagnose you have a you have fluid is easy you have a peritoneal seedling is easy or you have a lymph node i mean how do you in fact in fact sushant we general pediatricians get uh, such type of reports from The radiologists and parents come that this much size lymph node is showing. So this is a very common problem or headache. So please right. specify. First thing, what I will like to talk about abdominal TB is it is a challenging TB to diagnose. Number one, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. as we said, sputum or gastric aspirate is still a easier sample to get as compared to an abdominal sample. Correct. But the first thing what happens in an abdominal TB is I'll go back to the basics where what we all have learned in our MBBS days. Mm -hmm. Any mother coming to the OPD. With a history, he बच्चे को पेट में दर्द है, okay? Before we even think, we write a sonography. Mm -hmm. so this, mm -hmm. this this has to stop somewhere. First, characterize the symptoms properly. Like we said, more than 15 days symptoms. Now mm -hmm. see, most of the children when we see you know, पेट में दर्द है, mother is complaining, एक महीना हो गया, दो महीना हो गया. You see the child, child is dancing in your OPD. He is okay. Mm -hmm. is okay. Everything is okay. So first of all, we should establish whether it is actually a significant complaint or it is not a significant. So complaint. over the first clinical algorithm, as told by yes. Dr. Vijay Vilay, is the first starting point. Is the point. first thing. Is the first yeah, thing. Right. Then we choose the patients who goes for sonography. Like right. if we start subjecting every abdominal pain to sonography, they are going to pick up nodes. And finding mm -hmm. a node in the abdomen does not say that it is TB. That is number one. Mm -hmm. Any enteric infection, for that matter, whether it is viral, bacterial, mycobacterial, is going to have lymphadenopathy. Okay, one thing. Now this is one. So part. do you go by size and the characteristics? Yeah, I'm coming. So I'm yes. coming. So now once we have a presumptive diagnosis, clinical. Now when we are strongly suspecting abdominal TB and we want ultrasound, we get in hold of a good radiologist number one who is experienced in doing all this abdominal ultrasound for nodes. Mm -hmm. And coming to the picture, what should be reported when we talk about abdominal? Now abdominal TB can be nodal, it could be intestinal, or it could be a combination of node and intestine okay mm -hmm. so when we talk about nodal nodal tb the size actually does not matter so initially it was said that more than 2 or 2.5 cm nothing like that even a 1.5 cm could be tuberculous but what we look at is what we have learned whether there are matted or not whether the capsule is intact the capsule is involved whether there are conglomerated nodes whether there is necrosis seen within the nodes correct the intestines the ileocecal junction especially thickening of the you know ileocecal junction so all these things omental thickening okay so this these are the things which are experienced radiologist can pick up so mm -hmm. having a clinical background with these features would you know suggest uh, us that this yes high probability this could be an abdominal tuberculosis and the last step still remains if the mm -hmm. node is significant we always go ahead and try to do a biopsy either an, like we in jj we have good interventional radiology department and i mean we have just started a dm in interventional radiology so we are we don't even go for a ct the, we have experts who do an ultrasound right. biopsy Absolutely. and we get a sample so Absolutely. abdomen tb step by step and it is very easy to err on to the wrong diagnosis okay just doing sonographies and putting on akt we have seen so in fact many a times in the last few months or maybe a year we have stopped anti tuberculous therapy which mm -hmm. was wrong for you know right. abdomen tb so and so, uh, and a role of lower gi scope in an ileocecal type in an adolescent yes. where you can get a biopsy from there biopsy. More, yes. less non invasive than doing a ct yes. guided biopsy Absolutely. and subject that to gene expert and culture and anytime it comes positive Yes, so I think uh, anyone wants to add anything you said sir was raising the hand yeah dr varinda please yeah so uh, in the context of uh, abdominal tb or the sonography business i would say one thing the apply criteria for recurrent abdominal pain is very important it mm -hmm. talks of red flag signs mm -hmm. if your recurrent abdominal pain is not having red flag signs because it's you may not always have the constitutional symptoms which we talked in the context of pulmonary tb or tb mm -hmm. in general so characterization right. of pain 
if you mm. do not have red flag signs, Correct. then take all the sonological findings with a pinch of salt. Perfect. Because remember, the sonologist is trying to help you. Mm. And he believes that you have sent actually a patient who is diseased. While right. you are using him as a screening test. Ki bata hai isko hai kya. Mm. And he sends it back to you, send that kindly correlate clinically. Correct, clinically. <laughs> we are trying to shift the ball between two people. So we might as well take the responsibility ourselves because that's right. where it actually lies. So there are some quick uh, rapid fire questions before we end. How many days we have to isolate child from school once he diagnosed pulmonary TB, Dr. Varinder? So if I would say it depends on the smear positivity. If, if it's negative, positive, it may require up to two, two months. Okay. Can other family members who come in contact with index case transmit the infection to the child? So like a contact of the contact. You see, uh, contacts, if are having disease, can always spread. Uh, uh, just an exposure, infected person does not. Uh, Correct. So, 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 Sushan, what is, when you say exposure, I mean, how many hours per day or how many days in a week is an exposure? So, uh, initially, they used to say one night exposure, five hours, six mm -hmm. hours is not mm -hmm. on. Even mm -hmm. if the person is there uh, for one or two hours and the person is of throwing out so many bacilli, even that contact is enough. Okay, Vijay, you have an NCC or a tuberculoma dilemma going on forever when it's a single NCC. Uh, can IGRA help in such case or uh, really it doesn't matter? I mean, it, it, it really, because IGRA would again be a supportive this thing. There are correct. better ways of differentiating NCC from tuberculoma. Correct, correct, correct. The, uh, so, the, you already answered this, what's the chance of CBNAT positivity in bacillus? extra pulmonary TB and if there is a lesion in the lung it will be holding to the same whether it's pulmonary or extra pulmonary to start with then uh, can we have the link so link will be given again for the videos sorry I couldn't put it today it's getting too late so that's the end of the question so we have learned today that first one, of all one, one more sir, small thing uh, sir sir uh, uh, while you were on links there is another link which I would uh, say can be shared mm -hmm. so based on these guidelines a mm. standard treatment walkway was made mm. by ICM. Correct. Okay. And okay. there are okay. one sheet on every disease on diagnostic. Right. Okay. We will so do that if next time. Those five sheets can be kept mm. by any clinician in their office. It Perfect. will be very helpful. So they are easily available at ICM also. Perfect. So we have discussed for one hour and 42 minutes non-stop. And I think that's the resilience that the faculty has shown today and all the people who are joined today. I'm sure it was a sea of knowledge and information. We've learned that do, do you, you, you detect or you suspect TB when there is a clinical syndrome and not just any cough, cold and fever. Then once you have done that, you ask for a history of contact and we discuss what is a contact that adds to the value. Then the first thing you do is an x-ray chest in the pulmonary TB. The x-ray that is suggestive or not suggestive, not suggestive, how do you treat? We will take in the next algorithm. Suggestive, subject them to the uh, bacterial diagnosis by gene expert, induced sputum, uh, 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 I mean, gene expert on induced sputum or gastric lavage, and there are ways and means which are shown by beautiful videos done by Dr. Varinder. And it's not just enough to say you do a gene expert positive, you look at reformation resistant or sensitive. And after that, also, it doesn't end there because mono resistant to INH is so common, almost 10 to 15 to 20 percent, and also fluoroquinolone. So, if culture is one positive, do first line LPA, second line LPA. And after that, if it still shows drug resistance, do a protein drug DST completely phenotypically to choose the best drugs. How to treat drug sensitive, drug resistant, mono resistance, poly resistant, MDR, pre XDR, XDR, etc. Please hold on. We will do a complete session next week. So we will do the therapeutic aspect. If all the three faculties can confirm just now, the next Thursday, same time, is it possible for you? Then I declare the date and next Thursday. I am free. Dr. Ramesh is also free. Yes, all three yes, of you. Yes. Sushant, free? Yes, yes. Dr. Varinder? Most likely, but I'll need to check my diary. I, I'm sorry, yes. I don't remember often, but most <laughs> likely. So by tomorrow at least. And Vijay, you are free yeah. next Thursday? Yes. I, I think more, uh, you can you you can fix it for next week. Fine. So week. next Thursday, 9 to 10 30, therapeutic aspect of TB, and that will end the session. I thank everyone for joining in here. I thank Dr. Ramesh Bhai for being a co good co-moderator. All the all the dignitaries which we invited today at the Zoom meeting, especially the chief guests and the guest of honor, and all those who have been viewing on the web stream program uh, this program. I'm sure this was very, very, very efficient and very, very informative. The same thing is going to go on a YouTube. So if you have missed partly, fully, etc., the same link will take you to YouTube. And you can see this on YouTube. It will remain there for at least next three to six months. And next Thursday, 
same time 9 to 10 30 we will do the part two of tb confusion and consensus in the form of treatment of tuberculosis i thank Nitin, everyone Nitin, yes Nitin, uh, vijay two quick comments one thing yes, yes. i think nth number of time that i was hearing varinder talk on x-rays and mm -hmm. let me tell you, I mean, I mean, it's so interesting. <laughs> it's so, you know, it makes it and, so and interesting. he only showed 5% of what collection he has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ramesh, why? To conclude. One. And secondly, secondly yeah. the question uh, was uh, made very interesting by the uh, excellent moderation by Nitin and Ramesh. I must say well, that. Thank you. Ramesh, yeah, Absolutely. Equally, equally uh, important in contributing. Thank you. Thank I, you so I much. I did not realize it's one hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Varinder sir, Vijay Vle, sir, Sushant. I mean, it was a yeah. wonderful session. I'm very sure that all those who attended, especially Gujarat Pediatrician members, they might have enjoyed. And next week, same time, because as Nitin Bhai said, sooner the better. In, it should be in a flow. So the memory would be fresh. So we'll be meeting next Thursday. And Nitin Bhai will announce finally tomorrow. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have, 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 have a peaceful sleep. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll share the link uh, tomorrow so that we can share it with all the doctors uh, who have not attended and who have attended, they can also refresh their uh, thing. And tomorrow we'll also create a newer link uh, with, uh, you know, the second session on next Thursday, which can be helpful for everyone. Thank you very much for your time. And it was really, really interesting. I learned a lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Sir. Good night. Good night. Good night, all. Enjoy your night. Good night.